So good morning, everyone. <laughs> so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm currently working in Red Hat in the Fedora engineering team as Fedora Cloud Engineer. I'm also an ambassador and contributor to Fedora project for almost over 10 years now. I'm one of the core developers of C Python, that is the Python programming language. And I try to write blog posts at kusheldas.in. So that's my formal work. And whenever I get free time, I try to become Superman. Uh, you can see this. Uh, I used to practice at home. Nowadays, I'm being able to fly outside also. But uh, this talk is not about that part. But this talk is more about what I do at work. That is Fedora Cloud. Uh, but even before I go into that side, I want to, I have few questions actually for my audience. Uh, how many of you are actually using Python in your day-to-day -day work or somewhere in your work part? Can you please raise the hand? Okay, so around 50%, I guess. So, okay, good. So, what we do at, uh, when I mean, what, when I say Fedora Cloud, so it's actually not any public cloud running somewhere, but it's more about the image which runs on different cloud infrastructure. That is, you can run this image on OpenStack, or Open Nebula, or CloudStack, or we also generate the AMIs for AWS. So if you look at, uh, from that perspective, the major two customers are obviously uh, right now AWS and OpenStack. And for OpenStack, what we create is normal standard QCOW2 images, which can be, be used in most of the other cloud infrastructure. And we also push the same image into other places like DigitalOcean, where you can boot up a Fedora. So, as you know, Fedora project is a community project. So it's a group of community people along with engineers and uh, people from Red Hat who work on this project. And as a part of the project is actually testing whatever we release, correct? So we don't want to give you any broken software, any broken operating system which you cannot use. So, and most of our test cases in general are actual BAS commands. So, Let's say well, I actually started working full time on Fedora Cloud in uh, 2014. So part of my job was to make sure that whatever we release is good. So work along with the QA team who are all, like we have a great QA team, but they are always overloaded with work. So what we do is we ask volunteers to download the image or boot up an instance in AWS and log in manually using SSH and then execute some commands and check the output. I have this actually. So this is one of the commands. So one of our goal is, uh, or one of the test case, what we say is no service should fail at the time of boot up. Like whatever the default things are should always start properly. So the idea is you log in, you execute the command, and then you check the output. Like nothing should have been failed. Um, and uh, this is just one example. So there are things like uh, AC Linux should be enforcing. We want that to be working properly. Uh, like different packages must have been installed, things like that. But this, I'm, I'm trying to tell you what we do as test cases. And uh, this is how the, all the images get tested manually by people. And that's the exact point where the failure part comes in. So the b biggest problem we got in was about not tested enough. Because end of the day, it is human who are testing the images. There was no automated system at that moment. And like I think it was Fedora 22 around that time, just before the release date, we made some kind of mistake which uh, made the image unusable in certain ways. And the release engineering team was really, really angry because it happened just the night before. So they had to work really hard to make sure that actual release goes out is working. And in another case, after a few months, we, uh, so we also have a project called Fedora Atomic, or uh, Atomic Project. So Fedora Atomic is now the primary output of the cloud group. 
uh, which is a operating system meant for containers, a bare minimal operating system with atomic states. So uh, that's meant for containers. But uh, in between, we did a uh, night. I think we did a nightly release, uh, which never had Docker. So and you cannot install a package inside uh, Atomic. Uh, it has to come directly from the, as a part of the operating system. But that was our mistake as a, in a nightly build. So so we tried in various ways to fix this. And me being a very lazy guy, yeah, that's true. I actually, even though if you see me jumping around, I'm a pretty lazy guy in front of a computer. So my point was, it was difficult for me to every time go boot up a, like, try to upload an image to OpenStack or try to download the image locally and then go through various steps to make sure that a cloud image can boot on my laptop without having an actual cloud and then test it. That was my condition. And if we look into the next question, about the projects. So the way I was trying to solve my problem, I think many of you do the same thing. If I just ask right now, how many of you have any kind of pet project lying around on your laptop or in a corner of your server, which you use to help yourself in a certain part of a job? Do you have any such pet projects? Yes, no? So we all know how this project starts, correct? It starts the open source way, scratch your own itch. So if you have a problem, you solve yourself. That's how most of the project starts. But then the next stage happens. I'm skipping. Uh, this is one such example. So it can happen that you will find someone on internet that who is trying to solve the same problem in a wrong way. Or it might happen that you will find one of your friend or coworker has the exact same problem and they need some kind of solution. So what do you do? You generally help them out, correct? We all of us do. And we go like, hey, I wrote this bash script or I wrote this Python or Perl or anything. I wrote this application. Why don't you use it? And we try to give them this simple project. So what was before that, what was your baby? Suddenly there are now two people using it. And instead of two people, it can become 100 people. It can be even bigger. So that project can sometimes become something which is there in all of our work laptop or all of our servers places. But at the same time, think after six months, think after one year, what happens? How many of you actually remember what you wrote as a program, script, or even an email after six months down the line, I mean, or one year? Do you remember everything you did a year ago? Yes, no, anyone? I also don't. So, and then uh, like as system administrator or DevOps, when we manage various these systems, and as I, I think most of us will agree that all of us have some scripts, which helps us to automate some part of our work. How do you think what will happen like uh, when your company or job will require some new guy to come in and actually fill in your shoe? Will they be able to understand what you are doing in that script and the stuff? But at the same time, our main part or work is to make sure that we don't get into those failures at the same time. And for that, we are actually, we want something which is there in all our computers. Uh, in my case, it was all our cloud systems, uh, the operating system which will work on those cloud. And there were mainly those two main parts. One is BAS, the standard BAS. Um, not all the commands may be available to any particular installation, let's say default installation. And the other thing was Python. So I would actually tell you my talk's may primary agenda today is actually to convince you to convert those bash scripts into something more readable, usable Python scripts. So yes, I'm telling you what is the rest of my talk is about. Uh, that's it. So. This is the actually end result of my whole project, uh, whatever I was doing. So it's a very small Python tool, like around 1,000 lines of Python code, I guess, in total, which can boot up a cloud image uh, on a laptop. Or it can actually now do vagrant images also. Or it can boot up uh, something in the AWS. Uh, and execute a series of test cases, which, can be, uh, which are actually basically any Linux command. 
and at the end of the thing it will report generate a report and it will destroy that instance so we use this right now in our production uh, fedora environment as a part of the fedora qa process that we test every, every each and every build we do each and every cloud build uh, so i'm giving you this link right here because if you want to check it out it's there it's completely open source licensed code and you can actually install and uh, execute it on your laptop it will not destroy your laptop but um, coming back to my problem, like we had those bash scripts and obviously as you know there are not many people who can come up in the beginning and help us with those tests. So now this is actually a line from a poem called Zen of Python. How many of you know about it? Zen of Python? Uh, so for the people who never saw this before, um, Actually, going to yeah, it's not used enough. <laughs> so, in any Python, um, if you start Python interpreter and just type this, uh, actually import this in this case. So. This is the Zen of Python. This is uh, one way of saying what we love about Python, what we want to do in Python as a programming language. And you will find there are like thousands of explanations of this particular poem uh, on internet. So one of the major part was readability counts. So think like this. Uh, for my work, what I had to do was uh, parse some sort of configuration file. In my case, we started with JSON and then parse it to a place where we can actually use it inside our code or script. And all of you, at least most of you are here bash experts, if nothing else. You know how to work around with the cell. And you can also very easily imagine how easy that is to do it in bash. And at the same time, how easy it is for a newcomer to come and actually understand what you do. I know it can be done very easily for many people, not for me though, but how easy it will become for the next uh, fresh out of the college student or a sysadmin who never worked that much. So this is one of the example uh, configuration what I have for my project. So in this case what I say is it's with a name, it's a VM and the image which you want to boot up and some RAM and the username. So uh, I actually had a JSON oh, parsing example from GitHub, but I don't want to show it here because it's too large, like how to parse that thing over. Instead, I'm just going to show what we do in Python. So we already, in the part of the standard library, we have a JSON module. So it provides two different, oh. Is this? Thanks. So that provides two different methods. One is to load from a directly from file, or the other option is to actually load it from a string, like if you already read that information. And that will provide you a very nice, uh, in our case, it was a dictionary of the data we want to read. Yeah. So the next thing. Uh, so we just had a tool which can solve us, uh, our problem for us, but that's not the end of the thing. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, one of our biggest problem was we never had enough people. Human, in most cases, it's not a computer, human become the major issue. So it was same with us that we never had enough people to do the testing for us, other than the automation pass or write new test cases. So what we did next was that we moved out from only those simple commands, but we moved into something May th you may think a little bit complex. We used something called Python unit test cases. So that command becomes something like this. Uh, if you are coming from any programming language background, you can actually understand uh, most of this code. And what we basically check is that no units, loaded units should fail. 
that's why zero loaded units um, listed for as failed uh, but what is the benefit what is the benefit coming out of that bash script into a, a python unit test case like this so for answer i have a question to you again how many of you actually have code running on your production which can do release blocking this is a release blocking thing for us by the way which is written by second year college students in india anyone uh, or you can think about if you don't have uh, college students that way you can think about interns do you have interns writing release blocking code we do not interns but volunteers contributors um, like one kid is from bangalore farhan uh, one girl trishna she is from uh, second year again uh, computer science student from calcutta so they wrote most of these test cases now like over the last one year and the benefit is that they already know python as a programming language which they learned which they use in other places also so what they figured out like oh we can easily jump in and start contributing to this and they can already understand like what is the effect out of it that they can block a uh, such a big project like fedora to be released so before that there was almost no one else coming in with new test cases and almost in the last one year i never had to write a single one because i we just had to document like hey we do you want to test this and someone just came up i want to write this give me a day so by nightfall we already had the test case written then we discussed about it and all these test cases by the way again are on github with open source license so later on if you want to check it out one of the major feature of the language what we call is batteries included that means the standard language the standard language comes with a standard library python standard library has way too many different modules for you the batteries so it has uh, modules to do smtp to send out emails it has modules to uh, like say if you do not have enough uh, networking related commands installed it can give you a socket layer which you can you can use it has a simple http server module which you can use to create a http server out of a couple of lines of code Uh, i just can't name all of them so there are many one easy way to look what you have like this is the standard uh, python 3.x uh, i compiled it in locally so it will show only the things which are there in the standard library i hope uh, like you can see ft believe uh, stats module url leave uh, unit test cases mock objects so there are is this visible so there is various modules available right now for you in uh, python standard library which is again there in all of your servers which are running so another thing the language uh, using a complete programming language rather than only bash scripting will help you out is about errors so this is again a line from our poem that errors should never pass silently so python as a programming language provides you different various ways to look into the errors in a granular level so i'm going to open up a code from the same project this is again part of the uh, like i skipped few things but again this is a part of the code um, coming from the tunir i guess yeah it works so we can see like we can have exact error case conditions and most of the python modules most of the python projects you will work with they will have this kind of granularity where you can see you can go get into the exact error statement even though many times it happens that the developers chose not to go through these details and they prefer to just say file or directory not found um, that happens too so again this is one slide i actually added i completely missed about it but uh, yesterday bhaiju told me like hey we should talk about that part also debugging you know how easy or difficult it is uh, to debug in various programming languages um, 
So if you want a full blown debugger, any part of your code, you can just add the, actually this one line, which is basically two statements. Import a, the Python debugger and just start the trace. And then you can go through the whole program. Uh, most of the times I personally just use print statements, but if you want, you can actually go through your whole project. Uh, again, a uh, little bit uh, different thing, Python decorators. This is a feature of the uh, language which provides us many useful solutions. So one of the things we have about our test cases is that our test cases can become today from a getting test. That is, that means that the same test can block a release from to a certain extent where it may not block a release. It still will fail, but it may not block a release. Or a test case can become something only for, let's say, AWS instances instead of all clouds. So we have, or that's only one. Uh, that's not only one single test case. It can become more than one. So think about a condition where you have to move suddenly like 100 test cases from one state to another state. Do you want to add if else loops or if else statements to all of the source code? So this is just one such example. Uh, you remember I said that we had a missing Docker a few days back. So this is where we are testing if the Docker is installed or not. But again, this is not supposed to run on a bare minimal ima uh, base image the cloud base image we have because that's for everyone. Not everyone will want Docker on the image. So this has to run only on atomic images. So what we do is we add something on the top of the function declaration with the address sign where we say that if it is atomic, then you go ahead or skip it. So, um, I'm going to a little bit more details about this part of the code base. Coming in as functions as first class objects. So in Python, because Python is a dynamic language, you can pass around functions just like a normal data. So another st maybe stupid example. So I just have a function which will check if the number is greater than 10 and divisible by two. And if only that, then it will uh, increment or multiply it with two, double, or else it will return minus one. And we have a function called map, which takes input, the first input is a function, and the next is a uh, list of inputs, which will apply to the function. And at the end, you can see it, it did only for the values, which are two in that case. And this is how we write our decorator. So this is the example of a very basic uh, decorator. So where we are uh, taking a function as an argument and returning another function as a result. Uh, the last line, return wrapper. So what happens that if I go next, we have a normal standard function def hello. And just on top of it, I wrote the name of our decorator, address my underscore decorator. So even though we called hello, it still automatically added those extra code, the extra layer on top of the function call. And it did after, even after my function exists, that after the call. So you can add this feature to say, add some kind of special error checks to let's say 10 of your source code uh, functions. Another major usage of Python in the system level is about being a glue language. It's a great glue language. That means you don't have to re-implement or write actual programs. What, instead of that, what we do is you use existing applications, existing scripts and code, and use Python to glue them all together. That's where one of the major feature for Python on system comes in. And that's where most of the operating system use it. Use it as a glue language. Um, I'm going to give you an example again in the same problem. So I wrote to Nir, I thought, oh, we are done. Like we can automatically now test. We have people who are coming in contributing new test cases. So we had a one final call. Uh, it's, it's an IRC meeting actually on uh, one of the Fedora channels. We go for discussion. And two weeks before production, the release engineering suddenly mentioned that, oh, we, by the way, you did something wrong in one way that we also do vagrant. 
and we have to taste that too. We cannot just say that, oh, we'll taste only half of it, we'll not taste the rest of it. So as the part of the Fedora Cloud Group, we release Vagrant boxes, both for Fedora base image and the atomic image. So yeah, it was two, just exactly two weeks before going into production. We are in stage environment, we just have to move it to production. And so our answer was like, okay, because we knew at that moment that we don't have to like develop a new Vagrant. What we have to do is just use the Vagrant and test it out. So what we had code something like, using this particular function call, uh, subprocess.popen. This helps us to call any other random command within our operating system. Uh, if you remember, before there was a system call. It's basically a wrapper on top of this, what we wrote. And our Vagrant code, the code base which actually does Vagrant, it does something like this. You may laugh at it. So it adds the image as a box. And we already write down the Vagrant file, and then you can see up the Vagrant. It actually calls the Vagrant up command with the provider, because we test both on LiveVirt and on VirtualBox. And again, we check the output to see if everything is up and running, if not, destroy. So if you remember yesterday's morning talk about crash-only software, so our tool actually assumes um, I never actually never knew about crash only software before, but in general our tool assumes that we crashed at the last time. So it tries to clean up everything and then come into a state to do so. And that happens a lot of time with Vagrant because it works really great over uh, VirtualBox. But with LiveWord, sometimes, sometimes if it crashes for some other reason, it may give you different outcome. But again, using Python and using the calling the system commands, uh, uh, just like this, helped us to get the Vagrant feature up by next day morning. So it only took us a couple of hours to have the whole Vagrant plugged into the system. And we, as you can see, we never wrote anything super new. We just called the steps one by one, the way you generally do in a Bash script also, but using a proper programming language. That gives us the option like, you know, the new people again, the same thing. Anyone can understand and everyone even uh, like in our community went through the point, they read the source code and they said like, okay, we can put this on production because if anything happens, almost all of us can go and fix it. So yeah, this is the failure I was talking about. Uh, I actually have a blog post about it. So LiveWord, the storage was failing because we uh, forcefully removed the image file. So again, that's our mistake as a programmer, but we did that at the first. So we had to clean that up. And as I mentioned, uh, from the community, what they're looking from us is that happy users, correct, happy cloud users. So they don't want us only testing for one particular cloud. So today they may wa uh, uh, want us to test for two cloud providers. Tomorrow they want us for the third one, or the fourth one, or the fifth one. It can grow. So I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about a project which we use inside our code base. That is called libcloud. It's uh, Apache mod. Uh, it's a project from Apache, and it's already can give you options, same code style options for 30 different providers. That means you can fire up cloud instances over 30 different cloud providers, including uh, AWS. OpenStack, Eucalyptus, and many more. And when I actually used it, I used it, I just went ahead with this because I knew there are enough better documentation and I can use it with both OpenStack and AWS. I never even noticed that it provides 30 different providers. So now I know that when in future we'll be able to automatically test on any other cloud platform, we're going to use the same project and we don't have to you know, increase our technical depth. Um, this is again another point about uh, C library usage. So Python as a standard, um, as a st pro programming language standard, we make sure that our users should be able to use already written C pro applications, C libraries. So we have various ways. You can use something like CFI, CFFI, or you can write your own uh, extension by raw C by hand. 
and that's one of the major reason like our C extension code is, is huge. There are so many different projects for which we have a Python extension written using C. Uh, and again, many people actually say Python is slow, correct? There, are there anyone here who will say that? Yes, no? In some cases, yes, correct? So this, again, this becomes a easy way if you feel like, oh, I don't, should not use Python. But instead of that, you can use that other library which is written in C or C++ and get it working with your Python code. So from the, pro, uh, the programmer's point of view, you will still be using Python, but you are using a uh, library which is written in C or C++. Now the best part of the language. The language comes with a great community. Um, all of you, almost uh, most of you are here from Bangalore. And how many of you heard about Bankpipers? Okay, only very few. For the rest of you, Bankpipers is, I think, one of the oldest and the most active Python community in India. Uh, we have monthly meetings here in Bangalore and some special workshops also. And, and it's exactly the same in the global level. So if you go to Hash Python channel on IRC and ask any question, it's almost certain that you will get an answer. Uh, you can talk to almost most of the upstream developers over the mailing list and places. Uh, we have a core mentorship uh, list where if you want to contribute to the language, you can go and do that. That way you will, uh, you will increase your own scope into the whole language area, how it is improving for the future. Uh, even all the discussion, what happens about how the features will change of the language, that is there in public. And we have something called sprints on, in the Python, uh, PyCon US. There, the last four days of the conference, we all sit together in few rooms and we write new uh, part of the language and different other projects. So if you, even if you are a complete newbie, you can come to us in the Python sprints uh, or even one of the Bankpipers meetup and you can start doing Python from there. Uh, whatever I learned uh, about Python or about programming in general, I give the full credit to community. Uh, all the time. And for Python, I mostly learned a lot of things from JS, who is sitting there silently. So, and that happened thanks to the community only. So, uh, at the end, I'm going to talk about two things, two particular Python projects, which are actually of great help for sysadmins. Uh, one of them is Fabric. Anyone here used Fabric before? Oh, so. All of you. I just copy pasted one example from the documentation. Like, this is not a difficult function, correct? Yes, no, anything? Okay, someone said yes, I guess, there. Okay, I'm sorry, but yeah, so you have to learn at least this difficult thing. So, and using the fab command, you can now, after this, you can execute it over thousands of different hosts at the same time. So, so if you have to do something over a lot of servers, a lot of different places, you can actually reduce to it to a Python code, something like this, and then execute and do some particular job. Let it be uh, git pull or deploy something else. Just thinking if I go more examples. No. So the other Python project. How many of you here already know what is this? So somebody said that, say it loud, shout it out. <laughs> Ansible, correct? Another great example of a Python project which is being used all over the world now for, to manage our systems. And I don't know if you saw it or not, but you can actually extend Ansible by writing your own Python modules. The source code is available. There are lots of great docs also. So if you want to use Ansible, some, something super fancy, you can do that. Um, actually part of our project, my project that uh, Tunir, particular case was you being able to use Ansible so that we can set up complex systems, something like Kubernetes. Uh, as a part of the Fedora project, we actually publish our uh, infrastructure details also. So we have a, a Fedora Ansible repo. Uh, I'll give you the link uh, later on over Twitter to my slides. So the repo part is actually clickable. So you can go, or you can search Fedora Ansible repo. So we publish all our uh, roles, playbooks, every details on uh, internet, so that you can actually reuse parts of them. 
documentation how many of you think documentation is important so i try to talk about documentation at least once in a, most of my talks because i find it like the, one of the most critical thing of our work so we use something called rst restructured text to document most of the python projects so if you go to any of those docs in readthedocs.org all of them are written in rst uh, and the presentation you are actually looking at right now i also wrote it using rst there is a python 3 tool called hovercraft so i can actually and this is the same way, uh, way to write doc string in every python function so when you write some python code you also want to mention correct what it does or when you do help on a, some python code it shows you those doc strings and you can write the same restructured text there so that's the end of my presentation and i think i'll open for some questions now i should have at least 8 7 8 minutes that's my twitter handle if you want to have and want to know anything about fedora or how we are doing in the cloud or if you want to come and volunteer or like you want to use the same technologies of your place you can come and ask us over the fedora booth we'll just point you to the right link Yeah. No. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not really a question. I just want to stress a very important thing that we have to do. Since we all are involved in operations in in some capacity or other, uh, the fact that we we are a open source community. Uh, I'm talking about Fedora. We are a open source community. and we have our entire ansible uh, modules playbooks everything is open um, and that says a lot about what we are trying to achieve here in terms of community relations that you can actually browse to our entire infrastructure code we have that sort of faith in community and that sort of um, you know inviting to please help us please uh, you know uh, help us in contribution yeah uh, i i mean he is also part of the federal infrastructure community so yeah other than the passwords and few other things i mean few other group variables everything else is open there for you so you can take that and start using it in your production system and yes we use that thing only i mean we now, right now i think all of our production uh, and staging environment is on ansible and all of the uh, things are available in the repo so you can trust our like code to be used in your production also like any other question anything related to python or any open source communities or stuff or like if you want to start yeah and uh, nothing really about that so um, it's about the uh, uh, fabric okay so uh, i teach python and then when i'm teaching python to devops i can kind of tell everyone to go and use uh, fabric but i always get into this trouble okay so i teach python 3 and when i go to fabric fabric is not error for python 3 so you end up do everything else in python 3 and just for fabric you have to go back to python 2 yeah, so, so do we have have you uh, so what we try to say that uh, if you someone is learning python right now you should learn from python 3 itself because that's the future of the language and moving from python 3 to 2 is very easy compared to if you low only python 2 and if you want to move forward to python 3 so yes there are some projects which are still on python 2 only and sometimes it's difficult but the basic of the language is most of the time is same uh, but the the test cases which i showed those are all python 3 by the way because uh, from a default fedora installation only has python 3 not python 2 The other thing is, what uh, were in slides I saw? You said Python two point eight. What's that? Oh, you got the joke. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, so no, I, 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 I just it was meant to be caught. I just put it up just to see if people are actually noticing what I am doing on the screen. So yes, there will be no Python two point eight. Thanks for noticing that. So Python two point seven is the last major release of the Python two point x. 
uh, we'll be doing bug fixing, but all the major releases, all the new features will be always on Python 3.x series, that is uh, 3.6 uh, upcoming. So there will be no Python 2.8. Yeah, thanks for noticing that. <laughs> Any other question? Uh, by the way, if you uh, if you want a Python resource, uh, like there are so many, we have great tutorial documentation. I also have an uh, open book on the internet called uh, Python for You and Me. You can just Google about it. It's again on restructured text on readerdogs.org. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, I can see um, you now. Yeah. So question on Ansible. So is this a like a competitor for Chef and Puppet? Uh, you know, for deploying on cloud, or is it is it more on your own? Uh, infrastructure uh, it's you can say it's almost similar thing and it's not only for cloud you can use it anywhere in the same way okay. and it's written again in Python and has its own features so I'm not an Ansible expert to you know tell you which is better or no, no, no. why I'm it not, is better but is yeah it, it is exactly the same yeah. it, they are in the same space yes okay. uh, so you can just type Ansible and these days like mo many, too many people are using it so you'll find a solution uh, yeah. anything else yes yeah. back yeah I'd like to add to the Ansible Chef thing. Uh, I don't think Ansible is like a direct con competitor to Chef or Puppet. We use both of them together. You know, you can use Chef and Puppet for your config management, and you can use Ansible for, you know, having like run these parallel commands, have some sort of a dynamic inventory for your network uh, devices and stuff, right? So they can coexist together, provided you, you know, decide the use cases for both of them. Yes, and Ansible right now can actually do network uh, configuration also. So it's like in Fedora, we use Ansible for everything, like in case. Uh, so it, depending on your use case, of course. Any other question? Hello. Or Hello. Don. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, can you throw some light on the project Atomic and how different it is from CoreOS where uh, people think like, you know, every component of the kernel is a Docker container, uh, rather that means there are two approaches. Uh, okay. Where, so, where you have a micro kernel or you go with containers. Everything is. A container. Yeah. So I have someone better than me here to answer. So can we get the mic to here? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so he is from the Project Atomic team. Anyone? Yeah, hello. So, uh, am I audible, right? Yeah, you so, can stand up actually. I'll, I'll okay, so you. Project Atomic is uh, in the same space as CoreOS, obviously. Um, but there's a lot of difference in terms of if you look granularity of the project. So, Project Atomic actually is a framework. It does, it's not operating system. But using the framework, we can create the atomic host from the existing packages of Fedora, CentOS, and Red Hat Enterprise Linux, or any RPM-based operating systems, right? So <laughs> what is the benefit? The benefit is the trust chain we have already, that we actually build a trust chain of RPM. So RPMs are basically, you know, secure, basic, signed through GPEZ and all this stuff. So we create an operating system for containers out of all these RPMs. And the, name, the way the name suggests is atomic operating system. So it's basically stateless. So when you start the operating system, the whole operating system stays in one state. When you upgrade it, it goes to another state. And if this stuff doesn't work for you, you can revert back to the previous state. It's like Git for operating systems. So the idea is, when you run containers, right? So the operating system is like the cattle. You should not worry about the operating system much. The attention should be in, inside the, for the application, the containers. So how do we create an operating system that will reduce the work of operations guys as system admins so that they spend less time maintaining the operating systems? So, I mean, that's the basic thing. There are so many other things around. But they're competitors. Yeah. Any other questions or else I can go down? I yeah, no. Uh, we're going to wrap the questions for now. OK, uh, so yeah. I'll be there in the Fedora booth. So if you have any questions throughout the day, come and meet me there. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Kusha.